Cooper. Welcome back for session six of 120C, 220C. Today, we are going to continue with the whole thread of design assistance and placing different types of uh, components and panels and things that we can do to create structures and actually go through the example of creating a big structure. We're going to go through and create a little uh, stadium that uh, is based on a lot of what we've been talking about so far and will hopefully integrate a lot of what we've been doing together into like a kind of cohesive thread that'll get you ready to do what you're going to do for this uh, first assignment. So let me just kind of recap ever so briefly. Last time we were looking at really different ways we could use some computed geometry to go through and place some curves and surfaces. So we looked at the whole notion of creating some curves either from uh, like reference points that we would place within the dynamo and kind of create a curve out of that. We also kind of looked at it the other way, creating curves in Revit and pulling points off of those curves. And we looked at kind of an interesting example of expanding spirals and really how mathematically you can go through and define something like that. And it's actually sort of hard to do kind of manually. So just how we could use some computed geometry and place some points on it to place objects. Then we shifted our attention to really dividing surfaces. And dividing surfaces is really a very kind of fundamental and powerful thing to do where we can take a surface and divide it up into a grid and then start grabbing points on that grid to either sort of place elements like trusses or beams or ribs that might support it and in a single direction as well as panelizing where we go through and we grab four points and make different panels that will adapt to a different surface. And yeah, this whole area is probably one of the biggest uses of like uh, parametric design. We do an awful lot of work with all these organic surfaces that have very unusual forms. Um, we pretty much need to sort of apply grids, do something they call rationalizing the surface, so that we can take all those independent sections of it, which are almost like infinite in number and form, and kind of come up with a system-wide way of dealing with it. In terms of common operations we've been dealing with, just kind of look at some of those. I keep on trying to maintain a list. List manipulation is turning out to be a big issue for us. We have all these lists, and if you don't have the lists in the right order, or you don't sort of uh, have them at the right level, you keep on adjusting them to get the data in the order that you need. So creating, uh, transposing, to flip it around, counting, removing items. Turning out list flatten is one of our really good friends. We do a lot of list flattening for the creating geometry, we had, you know, grabbing curves from uh, Revit. Last time we sort of added just selecting faces. So if you have a kind of form, then you have different faces on the form. You can grab those faces. Placing points on the curve, we've been sort of playing with that a little bit. That's kind of accompanied by placing points on a surface. So the big one is once we have a surface, point at a parameter, kind of very much like curve point at a parameter, only you know, with xy's as opposed to just x's. Okay? And then after we grab those points, one of these custom functions that was very useful for us was making a rectangular grid out of those points. There's not many of them that are kind of like that. We'll show you some variations on that today. Okay. Finally, once we have all those points, it's all about placing things at those points. Um, we place individual items, or we sort of say, uh, set, put a family instance by points. For adaptive components, again, you choose the type, and then if it's a type that accepts groups of points, you feed it groups of points in place of the adaptive components. So there's just some common ones that are hanging around in our background. Okay, For assignment one, let's start with that, just because that'll sort of set the stage for what we're doing for the rest of the day. Um, the idea is we are going to give you an opportunity to apply a lot of this stuff to design your own kind of custom, I'll just call it a shelter. Shelter is kind of the most general way of describing it because I want you to have some design flexibility in what we do. If you want to go out to Canvas and pull down assignment one, you'll sort of find it out there. I'm just going to open it up in Word since I have it right back here. And we'll just take a look at it together. The idea with this is really, we want you to go through and exercise a little bit of design creativity and design some sort of structure that's interesting to you and fun and just sort of something you would like to explore. So as opposed to being really you know, prescriptive about what you're going to do, I'm just going to sort of lay out the requirements of what your structure should do and then you can have some fun deciding on what you want it to be. So the idea is you're going to create some sort of shelter 
And in terms of that shelter, uh, I want it to be scalable and customizable at some level so that we can sort of use it for a number of different forms. And then in terms of really what it should do, thinking about it architecturally, I'm thinking about a structure that would provide some I'll call partial shelter. So it's protecting you from the sun and the rain, not necessarily from the cold breezes, because those have to be fully enclosed, but just something that can kind of provide some shelter. And you can sort of see some examples here that I think are kind of cool. This is an example of this is the Kenmore station. Uh, it's like a sort of bus stop, you know, near a subway, uh, subway stop in Boston. And you can sort of see there a series of different trusses that are sort of falling back down and curved. And you can almost see the panelization of the glass panels on top of it that are uh, conforming to those curves. This is actually pretty regular in form, but we can sort of make it even a little more curvaceous. This is an interesting little structure. This is a bus stop at Santiago de Calatrava, who did something like that. He does an awful lot of things that look sort of like this, where you sort of see the structural ribs and skeleton and kind of these very, I think, very interesting structures. But again, just providing some shelter at the bus station. It's a little sort of stage. So oh, I think of that when I say a band shell or something like that. It's a little stage, a temporary structure just to kind of keep the rain off the performers or the sun off of them because it gets awfully hot sometimes. Here's another example of one. But we're just looking for something that you could think of it in terms of being a bus stop or a train platform, a bandstand or a stage cover. You can think of it as being some sort of covering for a picnic area. Or you know, if you want to provide something for people who are sitting outside at Koopa and want to get out of the sun, just some sort of a temporary structure that can be shading them. Or if you want to think more linearly, you can think about kind of a covered walkway. I know on God, we talked about it last quarter for your project. The whole notion of you have a walkway between different buildings, and as opposed to just having a very straight arcade, if you want to have something that's a little interesting and organic, you go ahead and think about doing something like that. Okay, so a lot of different options. Okay, as you're working, just in general, as we go through doing these projects, I'm going to suggest you know, try to exhibit good coding practice and lay out your diagrams pretty clearly. Sometimes, you know, even as I get going, it gets kind of hairy in terms of how all the nodes end up and things cross over each other. But usually what I'll end up doing is creating some groups and trying to sort it out a little bit, just so it's a little bit easier to follow. Think about adding helpful comments, using the create note command if you want to within the groups. But really, all that will just make it easier for you, you know, two days from now when you come back to it, you may not remember why you did that weird thing. So, Leaving little breadcrumbs is a really good thing. It also helps us when we're looking at them to sort of understand. Or if you're going to put your example out there in the public domain and share it with other people, you know, it's really helpful to kind of lay out in a way that's easy for them to find where the input parameters are and just sort of understand your logic. Because the yeah, idea with so much of this stuff is we put stuff out there, we share it with each other, you borrow examples, you share examples, and other people can take your work and kind of keep on building on it. Okay, in terms of the specific requirements, I'd suggest doing something like this. And I kind of lay it out based on the number of units are the yeah, educated in the box score. <coughs> yeah, anyone can come through all the steps. It's not all that much, but I sort of give you some degree of like how far to go depending on what you're in the class or enrollment class for. Everyone start with planning. Just start by just thinking about the components you're going to use and the underlying geometry. So before you dive on in, almost I always recommend draw a sketch. Just sort of think about what it is you have in mind. So for example, I grab my little pens in here. If I was drawing, if I was gonna do my uh, bus stop and I was gonna do the bus stop using like the three point truss or the four point truss or something like that. The four point truss, just in thinking about the components, we'll find it out there in the components, kind of looks like this. It's got one, two, three, four placement points on it. Okay, and then when it has some sort of thing in the middle where it all comes together, it's kind of like a tube that goes around. Okay, so if I'm going to be using four point trusses, I pretty much need four lines or four points to put things on. So if I'm thinking about laying out something like this, if I'm going very linear, just think ahead. I might want to have four different lines, lines that correspond to each of those. So we'll have line, line, and the other little line in here. And on each of those different lines, I'm going to do a couple of different things. If I want to give myself the ability to make it linear, 
what I might go ahead and do is for this line, give myself a parameter that lets me sort of pull the end point on out to kind of stretch the lines. Okay. Once I have those lines, I'm probably going to go through and do something like put some placement points on them. Okay. So think about it ahead in terms of, well, how many placement points do you want to give people the option to have? You know, uh, just, you know, will that be a parameter? Will it be a sort of set thing? Once you sort of think about the geometry, then the whole idea of just actually laying in the parts you know, tends not to be so bad. But do some planning just ahead of your job. Think about how the lines and the points are going to get manipulated and use this. And if you're going to use lines or if you're going to use arcs, there's all these things. If you're going to use a radius for a circle, the stadium we're going to do today is going to be more of a circular structure. So it's a lot of different ways. But do some planning ahead to your geometry before you dive into it. <coughs> then, yeah, define that geometry. Go ahead and just put it in red as the lines or curves or whatever it is that's going to drive it. Provide a way to resize or rescale your structure. So for that, I sort of mean in terms of, oh, it'd be nice, like, for example, if you did a bus platform or something like that, that it could be one bus or two buses or five buses long. So think about the length. It'd also be sort of interesting to be able to go ahead and resize it in terms of, you know, up and down or even out. So think about for the Ys and the Zs for some of these things, whether those have some sliders that let you go ahead and change things. Yeah, the classic example, and what we did in the class last year was, you could think about this thing which might be a bus platform, and it could be a bus platform, but if I scaled it up, it might be an airport concourse just as easily. Because it's really just sort of very similar in form. It's just kind of a question of scale. Okay, so think about how you're gonna resize it. Provide a way to change the number of components. That's this whole issue of, oh, if these components, these truss components get placed in there, yeah. provide a way to change that so that you can sort of experiment between having them very closely spaced and very far spaced. That's probably just going to be something about the number of points that you put between the different ones and be giving yourself some sort of slider that you can vary that. Okay. So, that will get you in terms of just basically giving me sort of a scalable structure that has some components and has some surface panels. <coughs> That's the first part. For three units, you got to go a little further along. Kind of like take advantage of the mathematical capabilities to move beyond straight lines, kind of bust out of that mold. And think about what would happen if, you know, one of your curves or lines took on more of a mathematically defined shape. You know, could you introduce a sine wave in there? Could you introduce just something that's a little more interesting and give it a pattern? So for example, on my little uh, truss structure over here, currently the fronts of the trusses are really all at the same level. I could go ahead and take that last line and replace it with a sine wave and really get something more where the fronts of the trusses sort of wave up or wave down as you go moving down the line. So just think about how you could sort of incorporate something like that introduce a little bit of flexibility to it. You know, if you do put a sine wave in or something like that, oh, give yourself some flexibility. Let's give yourself, you know, you're going to do the work of putting that in there. Give yourself the ability to adjust the amplitude or the frequency. The idea with all this stuff is, again, you're creating sort of a parametric form that can be easily flexed and explored. So the form is essentially the same, but I have the ability to stretch it, deform it, kind of give it a lot of wave or not so much wave. And that we can really kind of think about creating a whole host of different forms as opposed to a single one. Okay, for four units, go just a little bit further. You're gonna put some panels on this thing probably to provide the shelter. But go ahead and think about it as opposed to just kind of flat old panels using some panels that have maybe some uh, openings on them that you can resize. So there's some panels that are out there in the folder that I kind of loaded with the assignment. One's called rectangular aperture panel. The one's called rectangular panel with a sizable opening. But both of them allow you to change a parameter and just change the size of the openings, kind of make it a little more interesting in terms of how the panels are. You could have the panel be almost fully closed, almost fully open, depending upon the parameters you enter in there. Okay. So give yourself some parameters so you can change that. Start by just putting a panel in that give yourself the ability to change things and give yourself a parameter to change. <coughs> then if you want to go one step further, think if you can kind of create some sort of pattern using those panels. Is there something we can do that will have the panels vary in some way that makes sense? Okay. 
And it could be, for example, if I had panels on this thing, and they were kind of wrapping up around the back, I could do something like, oh, I could have the panel opening depend on the Z of the panels. So as I get higher up, they get either more open or more closed. If I was thinking about, uh, for example, providing shelter for you, I might have nice big openings down at the bottom so you get a view, okay? But as you get higher up and the Z is kind of closer up in here, they get more and more closed so it's a little more shelter from the rain and the sun. Or you know, any other pattern you want to sort of think about. So just think about whether you can uh, do something interesting in terms of patterning the panels, either by varying the uh, parameters. You can also think about colors. We're going to talk about colors today and how you can set the colors of panels. That's also kind of a cool way of doing it. That's kind of it. It's very open-ended. You have about a week to do it. And no, no, no. It's, it's really not a hard assignment. This is one of those ones, you know, if you just kind of come up with a cool idea, the idea is you should be able to kind of play with this for a couple hours and get something pretty interesting. If it's taking a lot longer than that, like stop and come see us and let's talk about what it is, because it's really only intended to take a couple hours. It should be. It's, it's really more about, yeah, setting it up's not that bad. We'll show you another example of how to set up something very similar today. It's really more about giving yourself something that's kind of cool to play with. Okay, yes? Do you have office hours? I will set up office hours. Okay, very good. So we can like uh, go through and do that. We haven't set up for B now. I haven't set up for C yet, but we'll set up a time to do that. Okay. You have any other questions as you get going? Or do you, have, do you imagine something in your mind? No? Okay. I see some head shaking, you know, about like things that people could imagine. Okay, just, yeah, be creative. I don't know, thinking. Got I was something? thinking of the Kendall Square bus station, actually, it's in Boston. Oh, great. So it's funny that. It's, it's a good example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So just think about something that'll be sort of fun. Even better if you think about someplace on campus you'd put it or something like that. If you, if you give yourself more context, it gets more interesting. So, okay. That is the assignment. Let's put that away and go back to thinking about how you can get this done. Okay. We, when we last got together, we were talking about really dividing things into panels, dividing surfaces into panels. And I'm actually gonna go ahead and revisit one of the older examples, just cause uh, there's another variation I wanna show you. So if we actually start with, let me kind of pop into there, 6.1, the adding panels to a surface, I want to show you just an alternate path through <coughs> that. So if you open up 6.1, you might remember 6.1, that's the one where we sort of finished up last time. We were just going through and we divided uh, the surface into sort of a different grid of views and Vs and number of panels in each direction and uh, sort of put some aperture panels on it. So let's go ahead and start back over there because I just want to show you another node, which is a useful one. Kind of in the spirit of custom nodes and how things put th people put things out there to make things a little bit easier. So if you go out and open up, let me go back out to session six and I'll go to 6.1 Kind of open up that panels on the surface. See what's going on here. Okay, I have a lovely surface here. It doesn't have anything going on with it right now. On top of that surface, we can break it into a grid. And then in the example, we actually place both uh, beams going kind of from front to back and we put panels over the entire surface. So if you go ahead and open up again, you can open up B if you want to. I'll open up A, just because. Oops, I'm not opening that way. I have to go to Revit or uh, Dynamo. We'll put it all back together. Dynamo is thinking. I'm not sure what it's thinking. Is it open? Okay, 
So again, in terms of this script, let me just kind of hang it together really quickly. I think most of you have seen it last time. But what we did is we take the face, and we take this idea of some UV grids, and we pull it over. These are parameters, and it's creating a bunch of points <coughs> on the surface. Super. Okay. From those points on the surface, we have to do just a couple things. We have to flatten out the points because they're sort of not a nice list. They're actually sort of a list where it's broken into rows and columns. So I'm going to pop in here. Over here, I'll just say automatic so we can like, see it all. Okay. So it's in grids and columns, and that's not the structure we need. If I come back over here, you'll sort of see I've got two levels of hierarchy. I really only want one level of hierarchy. So I'm going to flatten it out so it's a list of points, not just a list of lists. So I'm going to bring that over to list and flatten it by one. And then out of that, we're going to make these quad points. And quad points are actually very fine. You go ahead and take a look at that. And what it's doing is it's creating, again, this whole notion of the first in the first row, the second in the first row, the first in the second row, and the second in the second <coughs> row, and making little quads out of it. Okay. That's a nice custom function. That custom function, my friend Zach Kron put together, it's one of the most useful functions you'll find in Dino. Does a very nice job. What it does is it creates all these different quads. But even it takes the different quads and breaks them down a row at a time. OK, so if you go looking in that list, you'll sort of see that I have a bunch of different quads okay, that are in the first column or the first row, however you want to think about it. Then I have a second group of quads. And I have a third. And it just has another layer of hierarchy here. So. When we want to go ahead and place the components, it doesn't actually want the hierarchy. It just wants a list of quads independent of what row you happen to be in. So once again, we do that little list flatten thing to it. Okay. What list flatten is doing is, hopefully you can see it here. It's taking the quads and it's just a single list of all the quads as opposed to a broken down by rows. So it's got a single list in there. <coughs> You'll see there's, oh, what is it? 30 items in the list, because the first one is item zero. Okay, And now we're ready to go through and place these adaptive components. Okay, and that's where we sort of left off last time. If you go popping back over here, you can sort of see I have my little uh, aperture panel. The aperture panel is kind of a good one. I'm just going to show you how it works. It has this whole notion of, <coughs> There's something called the wall angle, okay, which is kind of how steep the little aperture goes. Something else it has is this kind of what's called the wall thickness. That's one of the variables here. Right now you'll see it's two. If I wanted to make those little pieces, those bars, a little bigger, you can try making it three. This is um, a type parameter, so it's going to affect all of them. A little bit fatter now. But I basically have all these little aperture panels kind of floating around in there. Super. So they're just kind of perfectly uniform right now. But we can apply some other panels in here too. If we wanted to, for example, apply, there's this one that we put out there. It's called uh, it's, uh, it's a rectangular with opening or something like that. Let me go out there and see if we can find that for you. If we go to Revit and we say, Insert and load a family. Let me go to our folder here under session six. I actually have a folder called adaptive panels. And if you go through and choose its rectangular panel with resizable opening, okay, which is another one I suggested you might want to use you know, for your structures. Let's let that come on in. So if I would like to use that panel instead, what I'll do is just down over here under family types, if I can get to it. It's going to complain at me right now because it's going to try and make something that doesn't make sense. Let me say rectangular, <coughs> panel with resizable opening. I 
Okay. Okay. Notice that some of my nodes are yellow right now. That happened to us last time, Claire. It was that whole thing where, based on it, this wasn't right and it couldn't do what it did. It temporarily kind of complains at you. But hopefully it will make sense. Let's see what's doing it. Not quite now. It's interesting. It looks like it's still a little messed up. Let's see what's going on. Oh, no, it's just the orange in there. That's okay. So great. Come back over there, and now I have these sort of panels instead. Okay. So not too bad. If you want to sort of see the panels a little bit better, what you can do is I'll go visibility graphics and just turn off the mask. The mask is actually sort of showing right now, and that's kind of clouding our image a little bit. Actually, what else do I have in there? I want to see our panels better. There they are under there. What's on top? I'm not sure. I'll go to wireframe. Okay, that's a little bit better. Shade. That's a little bit better. Okay. So you can start to see those. Now this panel has a very interesting property to it. It has the ability to kind of change the size of the opening. And the way that works is as you put in a percentage anywhere from, I limited it at 0.45 at the top, and like 0.05 is probably the best <coughs> If you get down to zero, again, things always get weird. Okay. But if you go through and change one of those panels, Take a look at it. Here's the opening percentage. Let's go ahead and make that like 0.4, which would be a very open panel. Oh, very closed, excuse me. Versus 0.05, which will be a very open frame. So you can think about how you can sort of adjust the panel to have different size openings, just depending on where they are. Now, as you look at these panels, yes, Mr. strong guy. I have a question. Yes, for me, the quartz from the tabular grid. This question not okay. What has to happen there is we have to load it into the specific machine. Okay. If you have a load, uh, pa or like a custom node that's not defined, here's the way to try to deal with it. It's either going to be installed on your machine, and that's kind of a good thing, or for a lot of custom nodes, what we actually do is if you carry them in the same folder as the Dynamo script, then they'll always be with you. So. If you're always working on your own machine, then no problem. You know, you get installed in the standard environment, in the standard location, you always find them. But if you're working on these machines, I'll often load the custom nodes into the same folder just so they follow you around. But if you ever encounter that, you just have to go ahead and find it. And for this <coughs> rectangular grid, we'll do a, go to packages and say search for package. And then, oh, it's like quads from rectangular or something like that. Okay, there it is. So just go ahead and choose it and say download it, and it'll put it into your you know, installation. Okay. That'll happen a lot. When people pass things around, they'll give you a Dynamo script, but they, they won't go ahead and give you the custom node, and you'll have to go asking for it. Like that. I have a question about the lunchbox. Yes. Um, that's a very good one. We're about to do that one, because that's, that's where we're going next. But what's your question? I'm just trying to search for it. I'm not talking about it. Let's see if we can find it. I thought I found it, but let us see, because that's the one that I, so actually, well, the reason I went back here. Okay, let's go to search by packages. The idea is there's other custom nodes that people have put together that do even better things for you, and Lunchbox is an all purpose. Okay, I'm finding, try Lunchbox for Dynamo. Try this, that. That's, when I tried it, it told me that I, it's using a, that's okay. It's, okay. It's, it gave me the same sort of error. Try that. Lunchbox is a huge collection of a lot of stuff, a lot of different <coughs> stuff like that. I have it installed over here, and if you install it, it should be over there. Okay. Yeah, I got it. I it, will, it kind of complains. I think that the last time they compiled it and put it up there, they might have been using, we're using .90. There's newer versions, which are like sort of intermediate releases that aren't the official release yet. They may have compiled it or done put it up there using the latest version, but it seems to be working. Okay. And see if you can download Lunchbox and get that Lunchbox um, just, uh, so it's not red, so that it's actually looking at it's there. Now see, Lunchbox is a whole collection. If you go over to 
on the side here in your browser lunchbox, there's a bunch of stuff out there. So things for manipulating lists, doing, it's, it's just a very good, like, package. There's lots and lots of different utilities that are useful to us in the functionality. But I want to show you that lunchbox one because it's actually a very, very useful one in that what it does is it lets you take a service and it lets you take a U and a V where it's not a list of points that are subdivided, it's just the number of panels you want in the left and right direction, okay, or in the both the different faces. And it'll either return polygons, it'll turn faces, or it'll turn the return the quad points. So it's kind of a good general purpose when it combines three or four things together. They don't have to do all the flattening and stuff like that. So the way you can use that node, which is a very handy node, is as follows. Go ahead and grab the surface. We still want the surface to go over. Okay. Then for this capital U and the capital V, as opposed to my little lowercase u and v, my lowercase u and v, are, those are points, numbers of points. The capital U and V is the number of panels as opposed to the number of points. So I set up my little uh, kind of transform right there as a code block where I'm going to take the number of points, subtract one, and that will give me the number of panels in the U and the V direction. Yes, Tom. Let's see what you got. Okay, let's see what's going on over here. Adaptive component could be found, the input list of points. Not the same number of, okay. This is the area you're seeing on the adaptive component by points typically is related to just the, the points coming in aren't quite right. Let's go and take a look at that. Oh, did we break it somehow? Oh, looks like your list has three points. Let's think about why that is. Because it wants four. Okay. In terms of the list, say surface point parameter. Oh, I'll tell you what's going on over here. Oh, I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll take, yeah, actually, yeah, do that. That's fine. That'll make it work. What will happen is for the adaptive component, come back over here. The aperture panel, okay, that one's four points. It's good. For this adaptive beam, see what's going on. Here's the aperture. Um, I had one chain set up for the, well, I'll show everyone. So it's like, you can get it on the video too. I have one chain in this sort of thing set up for... Well, it's it's because of the type. So I'll show you what's going on. I have one chain set up for the panels. I have a second chain sort of set up for the beams. For the beams, I have three point beams. So super, I can still carry that across. So Don, what's happening is, if I come through here and I say, I'll just do the same thing. I'll get the surface across. And the U's and V's. That's fine. What it's going to give me is these little three-point collections. I'm still going to flatten it. That's OK. And I'm going to take that over. So what's happening to you is the adaptive component, which works with the three points, is just this adaptive beam. It's not the panel. So mm -hmm. go ahead and just change it to adaptive beam. That one should be adaptive beam. Yeah. The, the upper one is for the panel. It takes the four points. This is for placing the three-point adaptive beam. So it's looking for collections of three points. So what happened was, when you change from aperture to a resizable opening, you change it down on the purple one as opposed to the green one. Okay. And that's all. So can this back to the upper expression of it? Because you've defined U and V in a code block nearby. Yes. You know what U and V are <laughs> when you define capital U and capital V. Exactly. So yeah, so, so what we have to do here is I'm going to take what I did as little u and little v and just subtract one for them just to give you the equivalent functionality. And then I can pull those across. And for a lot of these like custom nodes, what you have to do is kind of just hover over the parameter. Let's see if you can. It usually tells you what it's looking for. In this case, it's not. It's just sort of saying some sort of variable in there. So yeah, it could be better documented in terms of giving you some clues about what it actually expects. So you can see what it expects when it expects in this parameter. Exactly. Well, in every case, it's, it's 
it's expecting something, and usually we do a good job of trying to name them so it's pretty obvious about what it is. And even yeah. if it's variable, it could be a list or an individual. It, it could be most anything, exactly. That's not very descriptive, and it didn't give you a very good like, uh, indication of what it is. No, exactly. Let's see if on the quads, if that does any better. That's, again, just looking for a variable. This is going to tell you a list to flatten. But see, this one, at least in the default one, they put in a nice comment that sort of indicates what it is. It's trying to give you some information, but yeah, it's just not very good. OK. The difference, why I like Lunchbox, just to do it, is that it really takes all the sort of surface point and parameter, flattening, quads from grid, it takes all that and pretty much does it all as a single node. Okay, so if you go through and, for example, do a watch at the back side of it, you'll see for panel points, it gives you pretty much the same thing as the tail end, the quad from rectangular grids. You still have to flatten it because it's still sort of at that higher level. It's still broken into rows. If you actually want to see the programming behind it, though, and this is kind of an interesting one, we're going to start making our own custom nodes. You can choose that node and say, let's edit the custom node. And you'll see what does it do. It takes the surface. It takes the U's and V's. It does some interesting, that's interesting. It's not giving you very much information at all in terms of what's going on there. A lot of it's happening inside of some Python script which is often a very good way of doing things very quick. For example, who was asking if you asked for loops the other day? Who was asking for loops? Ah, you were asking for loops. Same sort of, it's, you can, as opposed to doing this dynamic kind of uh, visual programming language, you can actually program in Python, which then starts to give you all those sort of constructs, okay? And you can get into that. <coughs> so even in here, let's see if I can edit this. Let's say edit that. There's the underlying Python script. So you'll see they started out with a for loop and doing some different things. So yeah. available to us. We'll play around with that later in the quarter. But uh, it all sort of hangs together. You can sort of keep on digging in. And it's sort of an open source world. You can sort of explore other people's work. The problem with doing it in Python, Python tends to be very efficient and stuff like that. But it's kind of hard for a lot of people to follow it if you don't know what's going on. So. Lunchbox is just an alternative. I show it to only because it's, you know, kind of took a lot of work and consolidated it and stuff like that. And there's a lot of custom nodes that'll do things. They're kind of interesting. Okay. So let's kind of hang there. So in terms of putting the basic panels on, is that sort of making sense? Okay. And what kind of errors are you getting? What's going on over there? Okay, we got the okay, adaptive component there. Let's see what happens. You flatten that by one, you flatten that. Let's back up a little, let's take a look at your quads. Okay, it says null right now, so we're gonna keep on backing up to sort of see what we're coming up with. Let's see the surface points. Okay, now that sort of looks pretty good. Interesting. Let's go to the <coughs> flattened list. Okay, that's still looking pretty good. Although, yeah, that's fine. No, wait, hang on. Surface points there, that's X and Y. That's fine. Let's see what's coming out of quads. Quads is coming out null. Okay, so something's broken in that node. In this case, I think everything is cool. What I might do is just sort of close you know, Dynamo and reopen it. There might be some sort of goofy error in terms of just having happening in the background because it certainly looks like you're hung together, right? Because you're doing the same thing. Just for whatever reason, like quads, it's just not giving you what you want it to get. Put it back out of there. Did it, did it ever or did it just sort of start doing that? Or was that doing that from the beginning? Um, well, I've been on this machine from the start of the semester. Okay. So we'll see if the quads works in another one. If not, I'd say let's re, -re, -re download <coughs> the quads. Okay. okay. Or, if you have a popular over here, try pulling that list of panel points down. So that'll work. It's, it's just another way. I, I bet there's something that's goofy about that node, but now 
you know, we've got to figure out what's wrong with the node. And if, if restarting Dynamo doesn't do it, then what I'll do is I'll just re-download the, the, the package. Okay. No worries. Okay. Let us shift our attention ever so briefly to a slightly different example. Ooh, that keeps logging me out. Okay. The idea is we got all these panels. That's pretty good. Creating panels is not so hard. You sort of get that out. That's a good, very repetitive pattern. The question now, what do you do with those panels? Okay, and there's a lot of things we can do. We can set their parameters to kind of try and create different patterns, or we're going to learn to set the parameters based on different values we compute. For example, the directness to the sun, how much insulation it's getting, what direction it's facing. There's a lot of things we can use to mathematically compute what the aperture should be. But a simple little one that I like to start with, because it's kind of fun to play with, is the whole idea of mapping them to different colors. And the idea in this example is really, can we go ahead and just read the image file? So some sort of picture, the picture of photograph that you've selected, and if we gridded that and sampled color off the photo, can we really sort of transfer those colors to the panels inside the remit objects? Okay. <laughs> so what we're going to do is select an image file. Okay, selecting the image file is not so bad. Well, it starts with a file path and we go from there. Then we read some images, color images. Actually, I need to change this. This is not correct anymore. I'll take that out right now because it actually got replaced with three different nodes. <coughs> where we have to uh, read some color images or values from that image file. Then we adjust the values of, you know, to go ahead and organize them in a way that they're ready to match the surface. And what I mean by adjusting them is we're going to play around with that image and we're going to decide is it in the right orientation? Do we need to flip it either horizontally or vertically? What do we need to do to get, get mapped on the way we want it to be? Finally, if we have a list of colors sort of organized the way that we want to map it on there, We'll just apply the color values. <coughs> and applying them is not bad at all. We just use a very similar, simple func uh, simple function called element override color view. So you grab a bunch of panels, you give it a list of colors, and it just makes them the color that you feed it. That's actually not too bad. Okay, where all the interest happens in this one is really in that middle of uh, adjusting the map of uh, surface. Because what's going to happen is, based on what we want to do, whether we want to flip it vertically or horizontally or not at all, okay, you need to do different things to the list of values. And the overview of what's going on here is the list of values is going to be one long flat list. If we chop the list, what we're doing is breaking it up into, for example, rows. Then if we transpose it, we're going to change the rows into columns. And if we reverse it, it does a flip. So, Depending upon what you transpose or don't transpose, it'll basically control whether you're flipping left or column-wise or you're flipping row-wise. Okay, so that may make more sense after we see it. Okay, if you can, please open up 6.2 and get ready to open your, your own sort of uh, like photo. So I think on almost all these machines, there's going to be some images kind of sitting around the desktop. But we'll see. Six point two. Let us see what's going on. It's gonna be a very simple surface here. Not too much to it. I got this little sort of pseudo transparent surface just kind of hanging out over there. We can kind of change it around a little bit if you want to. Just so you know where this surface came from, this surface is really just a little Revit family. If I edit the family, you'll sort of see that it's defined by a couple different curves. Super. So if I want to change the surface, I can, for example, oh, you know, just pull the curve up. Or pull that curve out. So this is an example of defining them in Revit as opposed to defining them mathematically. I could do it the other way. I could also create three lines using points that I define mathematically and kind of make the surface that way by lofting the surface together. Either way it'll work. But 
Let me load that back in. Okay, the surface looks a little different now, not too much. Okay, but the idea is we're going to take that surface and map an image to it. So to do that, what we're going to do is go to the add-ins and let us open up 6.2, and we'll start with 6.2, probably 1A, something like that. Six point two, let's go for one A. <coughs> okay, so let's start with some of the basics in terms of what's going on. We go right up to the top of the file. Well, right over here is a good place to start. You'll see we have the surface right there. And it probably is already selected. It has a number there indicating something is selected. If you want to go ahead and reselect it, you can, or select a different surface you can. But yeah, that'll always be, I'll just say select or change that. I'll grab that. Looks like it's still the same one. Okay. Right above that, you'll see I have a couple of different sliders for the number of rows and columns. That's just for that surface. What am I going to break it up into? In this case, let me start with something a little bit smaller, like a 10 by 10 grid. What's going to happen is this can take some time, so I'm going to start. <coughs> First with a kind of uh, perfectly square grid. That's a little more forgiving. No one change its size and kind of make it a little bit finer. And you'll see that I have sort of a number of Y samples and I have a number of X samples. So if I think about it in terms of X and Y, I guess the first number, the top number is probably the number of what I call columns and the Y's is the number of rows, something like that. But again, those terms are gonna get sort of strange because it sort of depends on which way you're looking at it. What I'd like to do is actually go through and for that face, okay, go through and just, uh, what is it? Put in like a, just a series of different kind of flat plot panels, just sort of like, uh, you know, match that grid. So what I'm gonna do is take the surface down. Okay. I'm also going to go through and compute just sort of some U's and V's. Now, I'm not using the lunchbox. If you're using the lunchbox, you could just use these values themselves because that lunchbox function just goes for the number of panels. What I'm still doing is the other way where I'm doing it by the placement points. So I have to add plus one to it because if I have 10 panels, I need 11 points in each direction. Okay, so watch out for that. But you do that, you're going to get these surface points as a parameter, we're going to flatten it, put the quads, and yeah, you've seen that. That's a kind of very common block. After you have your rectangular grid of points, let me go ahead and put this on auto also. Oops, so it's good on here. Oh, I need to hook up my U's and V's, so I need to take that down to U and take that down to V, just so I can make those. Put that on auto for now. So you'll see I have these surface points. I should have some nice rectangular grid of points. That looks fine. I gotta flatten it the way I have been doing. And then I'm gonna use a panel called just rectangular seamless panel and place that. Rectangular seamless panel is actually a very boring one. It's just kind of a rectangular panel. There's no aperture, there's no nothing. It's sort of a, a flat panel. It's fine in such a way that it uh, gives you a pretty smooth surface. Let's see what's going on. In this case, oh, it's interesting. Let's kind of go ahead and see what it's doing. See what happened. That meant it couldn't create at least some of them. Let's see if it created any of them. Looks like it created some. It looks like it didn't create that last one on the end. It's kind of interesting about why that is. Was that? Oops. We'll figure out why that is. I'm not sure why it did that. But every once in a while, there's just something about the geometry that just sort of confuses it, and it's having trouble. In terms of this sort of like circle yard thing you see happening there, What's happening there is the surface is actually sort of curved. The 
these panels are flat, so what you're getting is a little bleed through where the curved surface bows up a little bit higher than the flat surface. So if that's bothering you and you just don't want to see that, just go ahead and say visibility graphics and just turn off the mass. This kind of gets to a good point about just really panelizing in general. What else is going on in there? That should be turning off. Let's see what else I got going on here. Okay, there. Make sure I don't have it turned on. That's not there. So why am I still seeing it at all? Oh, that's the preview. The orange thing is the, the preview that's showing up inside of Revit. Where that's coming from is in Dynamo, we say view, and we say, um, where's the preview? Background 3D, available previews, and Revit background preview. Okay, so that's where that's coming from. It's basically drawing the Dynamo surface in Revit so we can sort of see what's going on. I've got this panelized surface here. My point about the curvature, which is this, that if you have a curved surface and you're approximating with a bunch of flat panels, you can do this whole issue of you might need to sort of put more panels in to go ahead and more closely approximate the curves, something like that. And <coughs> as you do that, that's kind of computationally more intensive. It takes more time, but it gets more accurate. So you'll find out a lot of buildings what we do is we change the panel size and we'll use sort of a standard panel size in a lot of places where we'll get to points of extreme curvature, we'll go ahead and have the size or we'll do something to kind of make it a lot more closely approximate the curve. Okay, so let's start with that. Do you have surfaces? Do you have paneled surfaces hanging around? Looking good? Mm -hmm. Paneled surface, panel surface? Excellent. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is just read an image file. So let's come on over there. You go on up to the top of this graph, and let's see what's going on. There are three functions that are going to sort of work together. File path, where you point to a location on your disk, grab the file from that path, and image read from the file, where it's going to read that and an image file. So it's going to look like for a JPEG or a PNG or something like that. So go ahead and if you can browse to something on your desktop. See if you can find something in the Windows pictures or something like that. There's usually something kind of hanging around in there that looks like a reasonable JPEG. I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to go out to, I'll go to my Dropbox because I have some stuff out there. It says the location's not available. We'll figure that out. Hang on, what's going on out here? Dropbox, go to my graphics library. What do I got in my graphics library? I have some things I call badge images, which are all those funny things. Oh, what do I want in here? Let's go for, everyone should have lots of pictures of themselves on their hard drive. I'll go for me and the dogs. So super. I read that file, so if I come over here, you'll see it just sort of points to a file. I go to image, and it just knows it's a big old bitmap. That's all it really knows. And we are ready to start doing something with that. What we like to do is actually take that bitmap and sample it. Okay. <coughs> so what I would like to do is for that bitmap image, big round head, and down here we have puppy puppy, <coughs> we have a puppy over here. <coughs> okay, so we got those sorts of images. What it's going to do is do some sampling, and what it's going to do, it's a little counterintuitive. You'd think that it would go from lower left, over, across, and up, and stuff like that, but it doesn't. It actually kind of goes in the backwards order. It was like sort of think it was a backwards order. And we can get a lot of detail about this, but it basically samples over here. And what it's going to do is, after it completes that, it's going to come on up here. And what it's going to do is at each of those different locations, it's going to grab 
not the entire range of colors. It's going to grab that one color at that one pixel that you happen to land on. Okay, which is generally okay. You know, I can see you cringing a little because it's a little bit hit or miss. But the more pixel samples you give it, the better it will do. You know, because you could just happen to end up on the one white pixel in a field of green or something like that. It's quite possible. But you go sampling that way. And what it's going to do is create a big old list, a big old flat list. And once it creates that list, we're going to have to do a little bit of organizing. Because what we have to do to that list is, if you can picture this now as being a list of, what, 18 different points, okay? When it comes to understanding that list, we're going to have to do a little breaking it up. For example, what we're going to do is start by chopping the list so that we understand it as being in rows or columns. So if we told, the, if you had a list of 18 points and you said, hey, chop it into uh, collections of six points, basically you'd be getting every row. Okay. If you said, take that collection and transpose it, what you instead would be getting is every column. So doing that. So the first thing we're going to do is just chop it, and then we're going to transpose it if we want to get the columns. Because depending upon what we want to do, let's think about what could happen with the image. If you wanted to go through and for example, flip the image around a vertical axis, okay, how would you do that? How would you describe that? So you have this big collection of pixels, okay, and if either grab rows or I can grab columns, you want to go through and flip it around a vertical axis. So what would you do? Would you grab rows or columns? Rows. Oh, yeah, sure. I would grab rows and then reverse them. Interesting. Or you could grab columns. Oh. No, you're <laughs> And You're perfectly valid in the way of thinking about it. No, exactly. You'd reverse you, the points if you did rows. You'd, 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 have, you'd, you'd have, have to reverse, reverse each collection of points within each row. Right. Yes. Which actually sort of would work. The way I did it, it's interesting because there's always more than one way to kind of skin this thing. I actually just grabbed the columns and reversed the columns. It's probably simpler. It's probably impossible. Yeah. So, okay, so if I want to flip vertical, around a vertical axis, and I have to be careful about whether I'm flipping the image vertical or I'm flipping it around a vertical axis, okay? Then I go for basically just reversing the columns, okay? Similarly, if you want to flip it around a horizontal axis, just grab the rows and flip them. Okay, so if you understand that little chunk of logic, you get your golden. It's really, and it takes a little bit to think about that, okay? But that's what we're gonna do. So. When you come on back in just a moment, what we are going to do is take those images, okay? We are going to sample them at this X and Y, so we'll pull that on down. That's gonna give us this big old list, okay? That list that's interesting. Oh, that's actually that's funny, because in terms of what's going on there, it's already sort of broken into uh, basically the rows at this point. I think it's broken into rows. So I was going to say we're about to list chop it, but they changed some of the functionality here. It's already broken in. Yeah. What I could do is flatten it, but I don't need to flatten it. I think I'm just going to be able to eliminate that node right there, because it's basically already chopped for me. OK. So we'll return to that when you come on back. Every time they sort of change the version and change the nodes around a little bit, little things break. It's never usually a big thing, but little things go through and you have to kind of figure out what is different. Because it used to be it gave you just a big old flat list, but it looks like now we have an ordered list. So we'll go from that. Okay. Let us break, please. Come back in five and we will continue. I have a question. Hang on, let me go ahead and...